Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found Was blind But now I see It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. We have already come. Twas grace, grace that brought us save the spark and grace will lead us home. When we get there, ten thousand years bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when. Thank you, Derek. Once again, thank you all for being here. Um, for those of you who may not have seen me for a while, I'm Al Jr. or JR. Uh, we're here to celebrate, celebrate the life of my dad. And that's what we're looking to do over this next few moments in order to really spotlight the different things that uh, are really the highlights of, of his life and his time on this earth. Dad was born on October 5th, 1924. And he passed away on February 25th, excuse me, February 10th of this year at the age of 92. We were really blessed to have him that long with us. He was the youngest of 10 children, and he survived all his siblings, quite significantly, actually. Dad was a veteran of World War II and served time within the Philippines on his term in the U.S. Army. He was married to the love of his life, Maro, my mom, for 67 years until she had passed last January. Quite a story just in that alone. He was a father of three boys, Ernest, Kenneth, Albert Jr., or JR, grandfather of five, great-grandfather of five. My dad spent approximately about 40 plus years in the trucking industry as his career, and he was uh, well known within the industry just as being a hard and tireless worker. And he also spent a lot of time faithfully serving serving people in his community, serving his family, and serving in the church environment. And that's what we're here to celebrate during this time. Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful that we can get together and, and be together as friends and family and celebrate my dad's life. Thank you for what you did in and through him. Thank you for the influence and all the things that he left us. And thank you that he's now home with you rejoicing with mom. 
We ask you just bless our time together, bless our hearts, and we ask that uh, you would be among us during this time that we share together. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to bring up Brother Tom Wolf. Brother Tom has been a, a huge part of our family and a huge part of my dad's life. And, and Brother Tom, thank you so much for, again, we were just here a, really a, a few months ago for mom. And once again, Brother Tom, thank you for the ministry that you've meant for our family and for dad. And um, Brother Tom's going to lead us through this afternoon. I want to do a couple of things. I want to uh, have a stand in just a moment for uh, the reading of scripture. But before that, uh, Ken, I mean, uh, J.R. mentioned uh, earlier, um, this is a celebration. But you also mentioned, bro, that uh, we're not going to cry. There'll be no, not tears. I'm going to cry. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I felt some tears coming on in the parking lot, you know, and then they ran them away. And so um, that's that. There are, so, those, there are those of you who do not know me, but a good many of us know each other. And uh, everyone, I, I'm just going to do this to get this out of the way. So uh, it is me, and everyone says it's not as much of me <laughs> as there used to be. So yes, I've lost over 125 pounds. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not the man I used to be. And uh, uh, Linda and I are back after 15 years in Asia, most of that uh, 12 years in, um, in India. And we have with us Sammy, uh, who just turned eight years old, uh, our uh, Indian grandson. Okay, we'll tell you know more about some of you may not know him. You'll get to meet Sammy. So what a wonderful thing for us to be able to be together and, and uh, so how do you say it's a wonderful thing when someone has died and passed away, but you know, everything that was just sung to us, I thought, the man that wrote Amazing Grace, remember, was a slave trader. He had trafficked, he was a human trafficker, and uh, he had chained Africans to the levels of his ships. He had beaten people. He had murdered people. He had thrown people overboard in the Atlantic. And uh, this man uh, in his life was overwhelmed and came to Jesus. And when he wrote of this amazing grace, how sweet, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. You know, uh, one of the denominations uh, in revising stuff, revise that to save, uh, I don't know, it was, they wanted to change that word. You know, we are wretches. We are pleasant on the outside, but there are things in your heart and things that God, if he saved you, you know it. He saved a wretch like me. I, I, I once was lost. I've been found. I'm a found person. It's a wonderful thing to be a a found person. So Al was a found person. And we come to, as you said, we come to celebrate how amazing 92 years. May we all finish well also. Would you stand with me to hear the reading of God's word? There is a time for everything. There is a season for every activity under heaven. There is a time to plant and a time to uproot. There's a time to tear down and a time to build. There is a time to laugh and a time to weep. There's a time to dance and there's a time to mourn. There's a time to gather together and there is a time to scatter. There is a time to embrace, 
and there is a time to refrain from embracing. There is a time to search for, and there comes to be a time to give up searching. There's a time to keep and a time to throw away. There's a time to mend and a time to tear. There's a time to speak and there is a time to be silent. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of us so that we may yet seek him. There is a time for everything. There is a season for every activity under heaven. There is a time to be born and there is a time to die. Those are the words of a son. Hear the words of his father. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you, O Lord, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup, it just overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23. This is the reading of God's word. And God's people say, Amen. Heavenly Father, minister to us. We gather here, and our common gathering today is because of Ali Barra. He has touched each one of us. We're not a random group of strangers or acquaintances. We are family and friends and brothers and sisters in Jesus whom you used Al Ibarra to be a blessing to our lives. Thank you, Father. Help us as we gather together, as we worship you, and as we remember Al. We pray this, Lord, in the name of the Good Shepherd, the one who has guided us. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few <clears throat> words and other people are also going to share by, uh, uh, by song and by testimonies. Ali Barra, I was just barely past the halfway mark in my 20s when I met Ali Barra. And, uh, from the first to the last, you always remembered Al and Morrow because you went away and said, wow, that couple really dresses nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? They were kind of, I don't know, were they neighbors to Anton Mendoza or something? You know, or something? Where did they pick up all that? You know, but they were always, uh, you may recall that I believe that uh, Morrow was voted in her high school best dressed girl in high school and uh, I my understanding is that Al already was a dresser but he got upgrades from <laughs> from Morrow you know you know so um, what a <laughs> what a amazing thing on his street in his neighborhood I didn't know this but in talking that when we got together as family the other night uh, he was called the Don in his neighborhood Don Herberto. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he baptized that name in his own way. He didn't have authority of uh, 
over people in a bad way, which sometimes that's associated with. But he's the kind of person who um, mowed the lawn of Mrs. Anderson down the block. And uh, the Japanese widow uh, mowed her lawn. He would go in the neighborhood around the blocks there and paint graffiti off the walls. He would cover graffiti. He would find a, a neighbor. I understand that as recently as 2016, a uh, neighbor was uh, struggling to get out of a car with her wheelchair, and he had just come from the hospital, and he asked her, could he help her get out of the car? So no wonder that, I, I don't know the exact thing, but evidently one of the neighbors, uh, whenever she learned, I don't know if it was from you, uh, JR, or Kenny from you, said that my father has died, and she said, the dome, and then she just talked to either her relative or someone said, did you hear that Don Alberto has died? How, what, a, what, a, what an amazing thing that there was, a, there was a certain quiet presence about him. There was a certain authority. Uh, I look for his approval. As a young pastor, I will tell you that uh, if I went, we were right at Easter time uh, in, in the, uh, Al Ibarra would come through the line and like give me a grade, you know, on the Easter message, you know, and, and you know, you, you were looking forward to him coming through, but, but year after year, it was kind of like, here comes, here comes, you know, and, and uh, he liked some messages better than others, and, uh, and he would tell me, and he always did it quietly, which was his way. And he always, we had a relationship. I want to tell you, we had a relationship. I really appreciate it because he was, he was like the age of, of uh, actually he was a little older than my dad. And uh, it was like, uh, he loved the word. I want to tell you that he would say, uh, that, was a, that was really good what you did this morning, Brother Tom. You, you really opened the word for us. That was very important for him. He was quiet. He didn't say a lot. That was it. It was over. It was gone. So um, it, was, it was a very wonderful thing. Uh, he was respected by those who knew him. He was a father who did not have a father. I became aware of this. Maybe you, were, maybe you have heard that or maybe it didn't click with you, but... I, I think this really came home to me just in this last week. He was a dad who didn't have a dad. He never saw his father. But he did somewhere find a photograph, a picture of his father, and he carried it in his wallet, and he kept it with him. But he never, ever met uh, or spoke to or knew uh, his father. I think that's what makes it even more amazing to me when I hear of how with you guys as sons, what he would do. You know, he worked for, I don't know how many years at uh, CME, the, the uh, shipping and everything. And uh, he did the time slips, uh, loading trucks and such as this, uh, well respected by all the men that he worked with. Uh, and uh, he, in the afternoons, he got off in the earlier afternoons. And so he would take his sons uh, to the park or to the beach repeatedly, week after week. Uh, you know, many of us have had jobs in which you wouldn't, have been, you wouldn't be able to do that with your children if you wanted to, right? But here's a man that took his sons to one of the parks nearby or from, from East L.A., from downtown and everything to, uh, to the beaches is far now. Uh, think about it there before all the freeways and such as this. It's really quite remarkable. So I think that sometimes, uh, you know, even God takes the things that are in our lives and, and brings blessing to others, uh, even after us. Uh, so uh, that he, um, he helped his sons get out of the neighborhood. He was a person of the neighborhood, but he also got out of the neighborhood. 
and uh, evidently he and Mara liked her. I don't know if he liked to go shopping or Mara liked to go shopping and he went with her. I'm not for sure what it was, but whether it's Monterey Park or out to West Covina, it's shopping and such. Al knew things. Um, it was interesting because for 25 years that we shared together uh, about in the church on Brady in East LA, he also knew what it was to be the victim of prejudice. I can say this for a person who is an Anglo. I saw things where I got a pass and other people didn't, okay? Uh, and uh, he lived in the times whenever at times being Mexican-American, he experienced prejudice with uh, the LAPD and such. Uh, uh, mockery and different things that happened. An interesting thing that I learned was uh, when he voted, does anyone remember Mayor Bradley? If you've gone out of LAX, uh, we remember, some of us remember when the, it changed names, it became Bradley International Airport. And he voted for him because he said he's one of us, he was a minority. Such, so it's like a, a vote for him. he's a minority candidate. He was a very interesting uh, bro. He was always interested, I know, in uh, political things and such. He would come and sometimes ask questions. What do you think about this at the time? He, uh, all those things. And some of you may have had the conversations with him on that. Over the years, I will say this, that if you knew Ali Barra, you knew Jim Shelton or at least you knew that Ali Barra and Jim Shelton were going golfing, okay? You, you might not have been a part of that, but you knew that Al and Jim were gonna go golfing, am I right? And I just learned that they were marshals at the, was it Montebello Country Club there? And, but see, being a marshal, really, it also meant that they got some free golfing on the side. Uh, I just learned that about you. Jim, so you and Al, it's like, what a, what a marvelous thing. You know, if Al Ibarra was your friend, you were a fortunate person, am I right? So, he was very good, he was very frugal with his money. His sons told about him standing in line for hours to buy butter for his family. I want to share other things, um, and there are one thing also, though, about uh, just his marriage. He was really a servant. He carried, Morrow was the one that did the Bible studies. Remember, she would write these notes all the time. She was writing notes, and she would get it together, and she would have Bible studies with women. Uh, and Al, he, he was more the quiet person like that. But how he served, how he served. None of us were there, but there was a time, one time, when Morrow came home from the hospital and one of his sons said he was standing by the kitchen sink and just crying. Difficult because of what, you know, it was as a husband to see your wife struggling and having difficulty. Many times Mara, I mean, uh, Al was something of a quiet person, though he was a talker when you knew him and such. But, uh, but he was deep. Things that he took hold of, he took hold of and just went in that direction. For me personally, I was the beneficiary of that. To have Al Bar walk past me if there were difficult times in other people's lives or things of our congregation, for him to touch me on the arm or just to say to me, I'm praying for you, bro. It's good times. He leaves a legacy. Those of you who are his grandchildren, great grandchildren. It's good to be able to say that Ali Barra was your grandfather your great-grandfather. He gives a legacy, an honorable thing. Others mention that when he gave his marriage vows, he was of a generation, but he was of a, of a person. For better, for worse, 
for richer, for poor, in sickness, and in health. Mm. These are good things. So, there, we never, what does God want us to do on a day like this? He wants us to remember. I told you a few stories. I want you to think about uh, a story, an incident that you had, and I want to encourage you to do this. This is your assignment. Tell members of the family. Tell his sons and daughter-in-laws. Tell uh, his grandchildren. Tell them, I knew your grandfather was this. Or you, you see, the, grand, the great ones are... You tell them because those are the things that are things that God did through your life with Al, uh, and you you're the person that can share that. I can't share it. I, maybe I don't know the story, but you know it. Those are very wonderful things, and it's things that we can do together so that we remember the good acts of God through uh, Al's life. <laughs>
I think for those of us who grew up in First Fundamental Bible Church, that brings back a lot of memories with both Tim and Mrs. Ramos leading us during that time. So thank you so much for being with us and making that happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, I forgot to point something out. You may wonder why, man, he sure is dressed kind of casually for memorial service. Actually, we sent out a little bit of a message that Dad, because he was such an avid golfer, that we encourage people to show up in a golfing attire. So for those of you in a suit and tie, ha-ha, the joke's on you, <laughs> because you missed the memo. No, but thank you for being here. You know, there's three, there's three, th three characteristics about my dad that stands out about his lifetime in 92 years. He was a teacher who never had a classroom. He was a coach that never had a team. And he was a servant who never sought out the spotlight. And that manifested in several different ways. You know, Brother Tom kind of pointed it out during his time of sharing just a few moments ago. You know, my dad was an incredible servant, both in his community, in his church, and with his family. <clears throat> Brother Tom shared a, a brief part of a, a story that we had told him last week in regards to how my dad, on the, down the block, there was a, an elderly lady, Mrs. Anderson. She lived by herself. She was all by her lonesome. And my dad would routinely go to her house, mow her lawn, take care of her yard, and nobody really knew about it. Nobody saw it. But I saw it. That was one of the things that impressed me most, most as a young boy. He did the same for another widow lady just a couple doors down that she had lost her husband, who happened to have been a gardener, and she would struggle with her lawn. Well, my dad saw that, and he sprung into action again, and once again, mowed the lawn, took care of her yard, and looked after the physical needs of that lady's household. And until she moved on to live with her daughter, he did that routinely, week after week, and nobody ever saw that, but I saw that. Dad servanthood also manifests itself in the church. You know, we sit here in this particular sanctuary of First Fundamental Bible Church, and this is the church that me and my brothers grew up in. Uh, this is the only church that I had known for, for several years, and this is what we knew week after week, Sunday after Sunday. And Dad was a very faithful deacon of that church. It's a, it's a term that we don't hear a lot of in the modern-day church anymore, but a deacon are, are those who take care of the physical aspects of what happens in a sanctuary and congregation. And Dad was a very huge part of that at First Fundamental Bible Church and was a very big part during that early growth. This, is, this ministry here actually started off as just a, a small Bible study uh, at one of our relatives' house, and it's blossomed to where it is now, where it's now over 40 years old. And I know my dad was part of the, the deacon and elder group that essentially helped hire the current pastor who's been here for 40 plus years, Pastor Alex Montoya. So the influence of what my dad you know, br brings through his life is really manifested by us being here this, this afternoon just to kind of look back and how he served through that time in his life. Um, Dad also was a teacher. And one of the things he taught me, and Brother Tom kind of alluded to it, Dad was cheap. He was a cheapskate. <laughs> Paying full price was just not on his uh, radar at all. There had to be a haggle somewhere in it, no matter what it was. The prices that he may encountered at the store or at the golf course or something or other, like, hey, bro, it's, you know, it's after 2 o'clock. Isn't there a twilight rate going on here? <laughs> and that's the, that was his mentality and how he treated, you know, his financial dealings. But on the flip side of that, Dad was pretty generous. You know, it was not uncommon for him when he learned of somebody's need financially that he would get out the checkbook and he'd support people. And he did that routinely and on a regular basis that it just, time and time again, I saw him do that. And there's times where I didn't see him do that. And uh, it was just a big part of the way he wanted to serve people with his, uh, his time and money. As we later ventured off from First Fennel Bible Church to the church on Brady when I was about high school age, <clears throat> I remember our first day at Brady. I remember Brother Tom, powder blue leisure suit, looked pretty snazzy at the time. And I remember my dad, we were just visiting our first time. In fact, what had happened is my mom and dad actually made a list. Okay, we're gonna visit these churches because we had left First Fundamental. We're gonna visit these churches over the next few weeks. So Brady was the first on target for us. 
Went to Brady, first Sunday, my dad starts snooping around the, con the, the, the sanctuary. He's looking for places to pick up papers and pick up trash. He's already kind of scouting the territory, if you will. And uh, we were actually staying a little bit later than most other people, and it's like, oh, great. Come on, Dad, we're just visiting here. But nonetheless, he had the mindset already that if he were to be part of this congregation, Church on Brady, he was going to serve. He was going to do what he knew best, and that was exhibit his gift of helps and, and uh, do what he can to physically take care of the congregation. Dad also taught me some other incredible things, too. I think one of the most significant things, he taught me how to love his wife. 67 years he spent with mom, and they were not all easy years, I can tell you that. There were some times where there were some heartbreaking things. I know we shared this, this story last year for those of you who were with us that, you know, my, my parents actually had a young daughter who died at childbirth, and it was a very devastating thing for my mom, so much so that it actually put her in a psychiatric hospital for nearly a year. This is before I was born. And so my dad, through that time, and I know my brothers, you know, shared, uh, you know, that painful experience before I even came around. My dad did everything in his power to keep the family together. And even later down the road during my childhood, my mom, unfortunately, again, had a, 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 a week period where she wound up again in a psychiatric hospital for about a month's period of time. And that was difficult for our family. It was very, very difficult. Me being seven, eight years old at the time, it was, it was very hard to understand. And Dad did everything he could in his power to keep us together, to look after the needs of his boys, and to love us and to give us what we needed. I remember him trying to cook dinner. That was kind of difficult for him. <laughs> I remember him cooking spaghetti for us. It was some of the most worst thing I've ever had. <laughs> but on the flip side, what a testimony for dad, doing everything in his power to make sure that we would make it through as a family. And we did. We got through it. As Brother Tom mentioned, my dad didn't have a dad. You know, his dad took off on him as, as a young little boy and never had a chance to know his dad. So on the backside of that, my dad really showed how much he was dedicated to his wife and dedicated to his kids, even through the most difficult of times. Um, as a, I saw my dad also as a coach. You know, he spent about 40 years in the trucking industry, and part of that was spent at a company called California Motor Express, where he was the dock supervisor, and he oversaw the guys loading and unloading trucks every day, all day. And it was amazing to me that I occasionally had the chance to work there as a casual worker, just one or two days out of the week, just to earn money. And what really stood out to me is whenever I mentioned to some of the guys there on the dock, yeah, I'm Ali Barra's son. They would stop and just say, man, I love you, Dad. And it just struck me as to, wow, the impact he had on those who worked underneath him. And they would commonly tell me how his positive attitude, his way of really motivating people and being positive about his words and expressions was the thing that, that stood out to them and how he treated his men underneath him. And in a lot of ways, even though he never coached a little league team or a basketball team, he, he coached his men. And a lot of men underneath him really appreciated the way he, the, uh, he confronted them on a daily basis. Um, as a teacher, you know, oh, as a way of teaching us, uh, my brothers and myself, you know, we have so much that we can be grateful for for dad's life, for the way he taught us really not necessarily sitting us down and say, hey, you should do it this, this, that, and the other, but the way he taught us through his example. His hard work, his love for his family, his love for his wife, his love for his grandkids, his love for his church are all real examples of how he lived out 92 years of his life. And I can really say, Dad, thank you. Thank you for this pattern, this trailblaze that you gave us, you gave me, that I know if I follow that same pathway, that same trail, life will be good, and God will bring us his blessings. You know, it's, 
is something that I think we all can take heart in and take as an example. You know, I don't have kids. I don't have grandkids. So it's always something I can't necessarily pass on to a generation of my family. But I know when, in the kind of work I do, I've, I've been involved in the education world. You know, I've tried to essentially display some of those same traits and attitudes that dad had in, in essentially being positive, in bringing God's blessing, speaking positive words, and just letting people know that they can do it. You can get it done. And that was dad's attitude. So thank you, dad. I appreciate so much what you've taught me in the time that you spent with us. I'm going to bring up my nephew, Aaron, now to say a few words. one too. These amateurs, I tell you. <laughs> I also didn't get the memo, Uncle. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Ibarra. I am Al's grandson. And today I just want to talk to you uh, about some stories and memories that I have of my grandfather. Um, you know, in thinking about my grandparents, my, my grandparents were like the cool set of grandparents. You know, I had my grandma who was a speeder and then my grandpa who was this buff strong man and uh i just you know just respected that about him but the other thing i thought that was cool about him was that he had a, a tattoo and as a kid i'm like oh i was just enthralled by it and uh but it was kind of a touchy subject for him you know you really couldn't bring it up to him and i remember asking my parents about it and they were said they said that he got it when he was in the world and so i remember thinking as a child like oh my gosh man grandpa was crazy he was in the world and, uh, you know, and I'm, my grandfather, you know, he, he, before he became a Christian, you know, he had his own way of doing things. And then when he became um, a Christian, decided to make that decision, um, he wasn't looking back. You know, he didn't want to look back. And that tattoo was almost like a representation of who he used to be. Uh, later on in life, I was able to talk to him about it. You know, he told me where he got it. And I remember my grandma saying that she just... Uh, was glad that he didn't get a girl's name on him, tattooed on his arm. Uh, but my grandfather was really resourceful too. Uh, no matter what, like he was always looking for the details and things uh, to work on. And that goes for like, he came to my house one day and he was able to like look at every single thing that needs to be repaired around the house. And he'd be sure to point it out to you. But it always seemed like he knew somebody who could repair it. You know, and if he didn't know somebody, he knew somebody who knew, some, who, who knew how to repair it. Whether it be painting your house or if you needed a, a smog, uh, your car to pass smog. But uh, he was also very meticulous on any given task. Uh, he, would t he actually gave me a class one time on how to vacuum. And I'm like, God, Grandpa, you know, I know how to vacuum. And, but that pales in comparison to this last story I'm going to tell you. Um, when I graduated high school, uh, my grandfather brought all the tables and chairs from the church. And um, so we had a, a graduation party for me. And later on that night, after everything was done, I went out with some friends. And, you know, stayed out late. And uh, the next morning, my grandfather comes in at 7 o'clock in the morning, wakes me up. And he's like, hey, we've got to you know, load all the tables and chairs. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So I grudgingly get out of bed. And you go outside, and we methodically load up his truck. You know, everything stacked perfectly. So when I loaded in that last chair, I thought we were done. And so my grandpa started tying everything down. And I was like, OK, cool. And then my grandpa was like, hey, come here. I want to show you something. And so he begins to show me this, this knot. I'm like, oh, okay, Grandpa, that's, that's cool, you know? Like, I found, found it mildly interesting. And he's like, you try. I don't know if anybody has ever, you know, been shown a knot before, 
but uh, you know, like if someone shows you some, shows you it, it's impossible to do like immediately after. So of course I just jumble it up, and I'm like, okay, I can't do it. And you know, he's like, no, 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 um, come here to me. And so he takes a line and shows me again. You know, I'm like, okay, I thought for a second that I, I was gonna be done with it. He's, so he begins to show me this knot. Oh, he's like, you make a twist here, you put this in here, you pull here. I'm like, oh God, you know, so I'm there working on this knot. And it, I was there for over an hour trying to, you know, learn this knot. And actually after that hour, I learned it. And he actually uh, taught me some variations on that knot. And it's kind of funny is, uh, you know, I've used that knot for years and people have actually, you know, commented on that knot. You know, he's like, wow, that's a pretty good knot. And I'm like, let me tell you a story. <laughs> but, uh, you know, whenever I have tied that knot though, I have always thought of my grandfather. Um, and I will forever always think of my grandfather. Thank you. Now my brother Ken is going to come up and share. Ken? I think he has to get a PowerPoint first. <laughs> we had to bring in dad's clubs. <laughs> my dad actually played golf. His last round of golf was at uh, 92 back in October. Wasn't it, Ken? October? So up until that time, he, he tried every way possible to keep playing. It took him about two hours to do nine holes. But nonetheless, his, his passion for the game was something that uh, has stuck with him for so long. And <laughs> again, that's reason why the attire for the day, just to kind of honor that uh, aspect of dad's life. I want to first of all thank you for paying respects for my dad. You've got to know about my dad, what an incredible individual he was. I have to admit, I'm his second born, and much like the second born in the Bible was a prodigal, I was his prodigal. And you know, it's just amazing, because of my issues of life and the mistakes I made, my dad and me were very close. In fact, besides my mom, we were probably, I was probably the closest to him, just about, of any of his friends. Today, though, I just kind of want to highlight my dad and how he raised us. It's already been mentioned that he didn't have a father, and um, I think, you know, it's incredible that he was the kind of father to us that, that he was. This is his mom, Mama Lena. Magdalena Dia, a woman of honor and integrity, but more importantly, a very, very devout Christian woman. And even though she was a single mom, she raised her son to fear God. And I have to admit, that one aspect of my dad fearing God it colored his whole life. And today I really wanna highlight, my dad in raising us actually did three things to us and I have to admit, my brothers might be a little, you know, um, hesitant to agree with what I'm gonna say right now, but I think once I share and explain what I'm gonna say, they'll agree with me, but, and this is like a family secret I'm gonna let out right now, okay guys? So just kinda brace yourselves. But in my dad in raising us, he drugged us, he brainwashed us, and he gave us weapons. And you're saying, wow, man, I thought he was a good guy. What's up with all this stuff? You gotta remember, we were raised in a rough part of LA, Boyle Heights, so my dad had a certain mentality. But let me explain myself before you say, wow, man, this guy, it wasn't what he, he's being portrayed as. First of all, my dad, he drugged us. He drugged us to the park. He drugged us to Nuts Bay Farm. He drugged us to Disneyland. He drugged us to Shaver Lake, to Yosemite, to some beautiful places. Memories I'll never forget. And he really got into it. And in drugging us, he really wanted us to mainline it, saying, are you, are you experiencing this, kids? Are you really getting this? This is a wonderful experience. We took photos, but we have all these memories of different places we've been to. My dad went out of the way to do, to do this. He drugged us. And in all the places he drugged us, though, I think the one that had the most effect on us is that he drugged us to church. When I was a little, little, little guy, you know, I remember being drugged to a church, and it was a Spanish-speaking church, and believe me, I mean, I'm Hispanic, I get it, but me and Spanish, we just don't seem to mix. 
And it was hard to sit there Sunday after Sunday, you know, quietly while the pastor was just waxing eloquent in Spanish. And I'm saying, Mom, this is boring, boring. Dad, what are we doing here? And eventually, God led us to Fundamental where his sister Frances has invited, invited us to, to Fundamental. And all of a sudden, I go, wow, this is pretty cool. That with the man saying in front, it really makes sense. And it was a wonderful thing. We started at a church there in Montebello and Olympic. Believe it or not, it used to be a Masonic Lodge, if you can believe that. And we used to rent it out on Sundays. And the pastor, Tino, started preaching about the good news of God and what that meant and how we all needed a Savior and what that meant and how we're all sinners and how we need to be forgiven of our sin and what that meant. And one day, my dad was sitting there. And by the way, my dad was raised in church. But even though he was raised in church, he didn't really have this connection with God that, that he should have had. So I remember one day, the pastor talked about having us as sinners admit our sin and then once in admitting our sin, realizing our need for the Savior, which is Jesus Christ. And I remember as a kid, I was 11 years old. It was 1964. My dad was about 40 years old. I remember the pastor making the call, the altar call. Hey, anyone who wants to have Jesus in your heart, anyone who wants to be forgiven of your sin, anyone who wants to go to heaven, anyone who wants to have all these wonderful things come in your life, please come forward. And that's a big deal in front of everyone to come forward. And yet, there I saw my dad get up. He came to the front. And I never really saw my dad cry much. But that day, he wept like a baby because he finally surrendered his life as a 40-year-old man from all the things he'd done in the past. My dad was a partier, you gotta understand, in the past, and he said he knew his need for forgiveness. He knew his need for the Savior Jesus to come into his life. So there he was at the altar, just weeping and crying, saying, I need you, God, I need you, Jesus. Come into my life. Let me say something also. Prior to that, my dad was okay and cool with us, but every Saturday, instead of hanging out with us kids, He'd take off with his golf buddies every single Saturday. And he'd bring them to the house, and, and he would actually have my mom make breakfast to them. Come on over, guys. My wife's going to make his breakfast. And they were every Saturday. And in a way, guys, we kind of were neglected in the earlier part of our lives as my dad was raising us. But once he accepted Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, there was a change. First of all, my dad had just about a two-pack-a-day cigarette habit. And he also routinely drank. We used to have beer and liquor in the, in the refrigerator. I remember as a little kid seeing it. But you want to know the day he prayed to receive Christ into his life, God took those desires away. He didn't go to Sylvan, you know, school for, you know, non-smoking. He didn't take the patch. I mean, Jesus came in and he just turned his life around. He just put away his cigarettes and put away his alcohol. And he started trying to be an example, a better example to us. And I noticed shortly after that, he began to be more attentive to us as kids. And instead of taking off on a Saturday to play golf, guess what? Hey, kids, we're going to jump in the car. We're going to the beach. One of the places we used to go to, I love to this day, is a part of Griffith Park, Crystal Springs area. And he ta taught us how to play, play catch with a baseball. He threw the football with us. And he got involved with our life because he was really now in tune with really being a wonderful father and an involved father. So I have to admit, you know, in, in drugging us, the thing that made the most impact in our lives was when we were brought to church. Because not only did he drug us on Sunday mornings, but we actually went to church Sunday night. I mean, the people don't do that anymore, but we went to church Sunday night. We went to church on Wednesdays for Bible study for prayer. And then on top of that, if that wasn't enough drugging, he took us to a Friday night youth group where my cousin Mamie Ramirez was a wonderful youth leader for many years. It was called CAVU, which stood for Ceiling and Visibility Unlimited. It was an aeronautical term. And that's what she and that church at that time wanted to instill in us, a vision for the future, a vision to do something great with our lives. And it stayed with me. In fact, years later when I was doing real estate, Guess what? I started a corporation, and guess what I named it? CAVU Ventures. So it had an impact on my life. So in addition to my dad drugging us, he also brainwashed us. And I'll tell you how. When we were really small, he taught us, you are just as good as anyone, no matter who they are. When you talk to people, you shake their hand, and you look them right in the eye, and say, hi, my name is Kenny Ibarra. Or, you know, when he, in some ways too, when he says, when you're being intimidated by someone, he says, when you see someone, you know, giving you a hard time, just picture them in shorts. <laughs> picture them in their underwear. And then you see, hey, you're just, you're just like me. You're no different than I am. You put your pants on the same way I put my pants on. And realizing we're equals. And that's how my God and said, you can do, you know, what you want to set out in life. And that's how he taught us to have confidence about ourselves and who we were. So in addition to brainwashing us, one thing that he really brainwashed us with was the Word of God. Let me tell you something very, very important. Right after my dad's walking down that aisle that day, shortly after God touched him, he became a deacon and was helping around the church, clean the church, everything else, but he also became a Sunday school teacher of all things. 
And I remember one time I was sitting in this class, and I was young, and it was the kind of class where you had young people as well as older people there. And I remember him sharing this illustration. He shared the example of Vince Lombardi, former coach of the Green Bay Packers. And the Packers had just lost a terrible game. They played awful. And then after the game, he brought him into the uh, locker room, and then he said this, today, we're gonna forget about what happened. Just put it out of your minds. But I want you to remember one thing. Amongst all you did, you gotta remember one thing. So he gets a, a football, he holds it up, and he says, gentlemen, this is a football. I want you to go back to basics. I want you to know how to block. I want you to know how to pass. I want you to know how to receive the ball. I want you to know how to work as a team because we need to get back to basics. And that's what my dad taught on stillness, getting back to basics. Let me share something with a golf club. This is my dad's driver. This was my dad's pride and joy. Back in the day, this club cost him $500. And he kept it near his bed, by the way. He didn't leave it in the garage with the rest of the clubs. He kept it near his bed. Because there's no one gonna be taking out his big Bertha, right? But I'm telling you, when he played golf, he would always instill in us, first of all, you have to get your mind in the game. Focus on what you're doing. Visualize what you're doing. And then in doing it, you have to set up properly. So you see your target, you see your target, and then you line yourself up accordingly. So he taught us how about really just going through everything very methodically, through the basics of the swing, of the follow through, and everything else. And really that's how he instilled you know, in, in, uh, in our lives his sense of, of teaching us. I'm not even, don't even worry about the picture at this point, because I'm not even secret. Like, this is my dad when he was younger, in his parting days. This is his marriage that he just incredibly fulfilled his vows with, his wonderful bride, the first house in their golden years. The one thing I want to camp on right now on this is that in addition to brainwashing us, my dad was an example of being brainwashed in terms of learning. My dad never stopped learning. Do you want to know about a month before his passing, we received a catalog from East LA College and he wanted to take some classes. He wanted to take some classes on landscaping. And, and, and plumbing. I said, Dad, you know, maybe, maybe we want to hold off on that right now, you know? But he actually he never wanted to stop learning. He always just taught himself. And by the way, in terms of teaching himself things that, that he didn't know about, he would do remodeling in our house. That's a window he put in. All by himself. No one helped him. He just learned through the books and what he did. This is the front porch he made. Before we set a small little porch, and then with my grandpa's help, he went ahead and built this porch all by himself with the masonry and with the cement and everything else that he used. This is a garage. My dad built a garage by himself with another partner. The foundation was poured. They put the studs, they put the, you know, the, the walls and the, the drywall. He just, and, and what he didn't know, he, he learned. He just found out how to do it. And that's the kind of you know, a mentality he had. Now, as far as his influence, first of all, to play golf, a few months ago, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but I do funerals. Part of the funerals I do, where we release white homing pigeons as a part of the ceremony. I've done hundreds of funerals in the last seven years. My dad used to, in the last year or two, my dad used to love to come to funerals with me. But well, one day we were at Rose Hills over here, and he said, son, take me to the grave of my, of my oldest, uh, my oldest brother. And he had never been there before, so we took him right here on the part of Workman Mill Road where his oldest brother was buried. And his oldest brother was his mentor. Maybe not even just in life, but also in golf, because his, his brother is the one that introduced golf to my, to my dad. So this particular brother, Ernest Z. Villa, he really looked forward to, he, he idolized, he, he, he really you know, looked at him as an example, but he passed at a young age of cancer. I think he died, not, not even in, in his 30s, he died. And of course, my dad you know, experienced that loss. Um, and then here's years later, my dad's love for golf with his friend Bob. You see you Bob here? Or I think you're here. Where are you, Bob? There you are. He loved Bob, he loved Anton, he loved Jim. Those were his golf buddies. And you know, it's just a wonderful thing to know that in his later life, he continued to play golf. He didn't give up on that sport. There's me and my dad. Now, as the years have passed, of course, this is a wedding for Monica and Doug that they went to, and uh, they just totally relished their grandkids. All of the grandkids they had such a love for and such a, a, a commitment to. And then here's them with Ernie and JR and Michael and Monica toward the latter part of their life. This is my dad, just last, last November, I took him to uh, one of the restaurants here locally, they're having a free a meal at the Veterans Day. 
And what's kind of funny is that we went to get this free meal, right? And all the other veterans are there. And then they said, okay, so where did you serve? And where did you serve? I said, well, I was in, you know, uh, Normandy. And I was in all these important, you know, uh, destinations of World War II. And he says, where were you? He says, I was in the Philippines, you know, enjoying a, a, a smoothie. Because he didn't see much action in far as combat. But nonetheless, he did serve his country. This is my last, uh, my, my dad's last Christmas this past um, uh, December for Christmas in Apple Valley visiting John and Eva and, and Tamara. And this is the last picture of my, my mom with my dad. This was in her bedroom, you know, the last picture that we had taken of them together. And now this is the last day of the White Memorial when my dad was fighting. And by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but my dad had a heart failure. His left ventricle gave out. And by the way, we didn't even know when it happened because after a while, his energy just lost him, totally, completely, just, just disappeared from him. And then even the last time we played golf, uh, about three weeks before his passing, he was at the second hole and he said, I can't go no more, Ken, I can't, I can't finish. And that's when I knew something was really wrong. If my dad had to go on to play and finish his golf game, something was very, very wrong. So uh, this was it. And, and, and by the way, when my dad was in the hospital this last time, he did not want to be there. He started pulling IVs out. He started refusing medication. He didn't want to eat. He didn't even want to drink fluids. And, and he, just, he just wanted to be home. But at the same time, he was just tired. He had given up because his heart really uh, wasn't sustaining his life anymore. So I guess I want to say, and this is the last picture I had with my dad about maybe two days before his passing. Michael, his grandson being there. And by the way, one of the frustrations with my dad, if he knew, knew him, is that be besides his hearing loss, he had a real difficult time communicating. I guess dementia had already set in and it was just really difficult for him to, to talk. And that was part of a challenge in just being there, watching him suffer that way. And then I want to mention Stella. She never forgot him. She went to visit him in the last uh, weeks of his life. And, and by the way, I think it was a Wednesday before he passed, she was there just holding his hand and just stroking him, saying, God loves you, we love you, Dad. And then he kissed her hand and said, wow, at least in his last days, he knows he was loved by his family and by those people that really cared about him. This is Michael uh, on that Sunday. And this is Bob and Robert that came to visit him about three days before he passed away. And I just want to say right now in closing that my dad was a remarkable man. And, um, you know, really, as I think about it, he gave us weapons. I want to close with this. He gave us weapons. What I mean by weapons, he gave us tools to work with. The tools where he exemplified was integrity and honesty. You know, when you ask his coworkers at CME, who, 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 who do you think Ali Barr is? You know what? Ali Barr walks a straight line. He's fair. He's honest. And you want to know this? They fired my dad after 33 years of service at CME. They made some excuse to fire him. Why? You want to know the day after they fired him, they had a walkout at work. The workers stopped work and said, you know what? You need to bring Al Ibarra back because of the example he was to them. And not only was he giving us tools of his own um, integrity, but also in his enthusiasm. My dad was an enthusiastic person. He just loved life, and he was infectious in his enthusiasm. He was always getting excited. One of the things that brought him most excitement was to find someone who hadn't played golf yet. I'm thinking of Doug right now, here. You know, his uh, grandson-in-law, I guess. And he said, Doug, you play golf? And he said, no, come on, you're gonna learn. Come here. And he'd take him to the living room and show him the whole how to club and how to hit the stroke. And then he ended up taking him out to play golf about a week or so later. And then he was really, you know, just kind of working with him. He just loved and had enthusiasm for imparting what he loved, you know, to others. And that was a part of what he did. And of course, my dad had courage. One day, in, during the walkouts of the Brown Beret and the Ra, the, the, the Lassa, the Lassa? No, the Rasa. That shows you how much of a crew. Okay, I got it out. I got it. By the way, my, my Spanish, my Spanish is very challenged. When we go in the neighborhood and people would talk at me, I learn little phrases of how to say, oh si, como no, or de veras, or oh yeah, right. And I'd go along with it, but I didn't know what they were saying. In fact, uh, if the neighbors, if we were in the wrong neighborhood and they were telling me something, they could have been telling me for all the time, I'm gonna come in your house, tie you up and take all your stuff. I go, si, como no, come on, ven para acá, ven para Because I didn't know. I just tried to do the best I could, but as it turns out, you know, uh, one day at Fundamental here on Gage in Michigan, they had a, 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 a walk out, they had like a, a, a march, a demonstration, and La Raza, La Raza was going up marching, and they were loud and you know, saying, you know, uh, brown power, brown power, you know, this stuff they were saying. And during that time at the, at, the, at the church, they were having a memorial service, another memorial service for my cousin Rudy, who had died of an overdose. 
And you want to know, my dad, no one told him. He got up, he was sitting and standing in the back. He went out the door on the side right there and engaged where they were marching. And then he holds up his arms like this. He goes, comrades, brothers, please have respect. One of our fallen comrades is being memorialized right now. Please keep it down. And then all these guys, they just stopped what they were doing. And they, he quieted down. And then he finished the rest of the walk past us in silence. Because my dad had the courage to go out there and say you're disrupting the service of a fallen comrade here. And you know, that's the kind of courage my dad had. My dad wasn't afraid. He'd just go ahead and say, you know what, you need to do this. And you know, people listen because of his passion for what he had to do. And in addition to that, you know, I think of my dad in terms of what he taught as far as even compassion. I'm gonna share something with you right now, but when I was 17 years old, I fell in love. I fell in love with a girl, and we got real serious, and we wanted to get married. Let me tell you the problem, though. She was 29 years old, I was 17. I know that's a whole other story. About the whole other, they can maybe ask me afterwards, but that's a whole other story. And my parents were not in favor of it. In fact, on the day I was supposed to get wedding, they weren't going to show up. But as it turns out, the Lord intervened, and that woman walked out of my life. But here's the thing, is that after she did so, I had already moved out. I lived in an apartment in Waverwood on 8th Street in Soto. I moved out. And mind you, as a 70-year-old kid, I was holding two, do two jobs down to support her. And let me come and share something. I'm going to be honest with you right now. She was carrying my child. And I had a responsibility, and my, 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 my dad, because of his own example, I wasn't about to go ahead and, and, and voice this responsibility on this person I cared about and just walk away. I was committed to making it work because I loved her and I wanted to marry her. But here's the thing, I was working two jobs. I was working at Connell Can Company behind Kmart here in Whittier, making good money back then. I was making almost eight, nine dollars an hour. Back then, this is 1973. And then after that, I'd go, after leaving that job, and I'd go work with my dad at CME, unloading trucks in the wee hours of the morning. And then, you know, after this whole aftermath had happened, and this woman walked out of my life, and by the way, she ended up through God's providence miscarrying this, this child. I remember unloading a trailer, and my dad hadn't talked, and me and hadn't talked. We were kind of like strained in our relationship. And I remember coming into the trailer, expressing his compassion. You know, it's almost as if God walked in that trailer that day, because I didn't feel that I was worthy to go back home after I had hurt my parents, after I had disappointed them. And you know, he came in and he said, son, we love you, me and your mom, we love you, and we want you back home. And uh, I said, Dad, I don't know if I can come back. I said, it's okay, you can come back. We want you back. And that was a turning point, even for my own spiritual life, to be able to go back to home, to back to fundamental, get, get discipled with back then Paul Gaynor and Richard Moodle, and, and kind of get back in the Word. And what an incredible turnabout, but it's only because of my dad's compassion that he reached out and reached down to pull me up. And I have to admit, my dad was just an example in so many ways. And uh, that was an example. Another thing my dad gave us weapons or tools in is just to get rid of the vices. And all the vices that are out there, he's a kid, and, and he tells us our son, you don't need that. But the last thing I want to share right now is that my dad was really one to give us the tool of recreation. The word recreation is the word recreation, which is to create ourselves. Dad was a big sports enthusiast. As I, young as I can remember, we'd watch baseball, we'd watch football, we'd watch basketball, and by the way, we would go to those games. I remember going to a Dodger game at the Coliseum. Back then, before Dodger Stadium was built, as a young kid, my dad had such a love for sports. And then, you know, even as far as um, football is concerned, he took us to a Ram game, I still remember, that's the day that Queen Mary pulled in here at the Port of Long Beach. That same day, Green Bay Packers had, excuse me, the, the Rams had a game against the Green Bay Packers in a playoff game. And Roland Gable threw a pass to Bernie Casey to win the game. It's an incredible thing, and my dad took us there. And it was a wonderful thing. Um, and then he loved tennis. Well, who loved tennis back then? And even now, most young people with, with their fathers, they don't teach them tennis. And yet there we were, down the street, there used to be a park, Evergreen Park, and my dad said, come on, we're gonna go play tennis. I go, Dad, no, we don't wanna play tennis. I said, no, no, come on, it'll be fun. And after a while we got into it, and it was very enjoyable. Even though all of the cholos and all the guys hanging out, eh, this is guy playing tennis. I said, it's okay, it's okay, because guess what? My dad was there. My dad was on the court teaching us, and that's what meant it. That's what made all the difference, is my dad was there. And uh, he also taught, taught us, by the way, how to box. We used to have an empty room. We used to have a three-bedroom home, and one of the bedrooms was empty. And we'd be in there in the middle of the bedroom, in Mary City, in, in an empty bedroom. We'd call it the empty room, because it was empty. <laughs> and he bought, us, he bought us boxing gloves. He bought us boxing gloves. 
And then, and then he said, okay, kids, come here. So he, he stand up to us and he showed us how to stand and how to block shots and how, you know, hits. And, and it was credible. I still remember. And I'm a pretty good boxer now because of that. You know, try taking me right now. Come on, take, take me right now. I, I can defend myself. But it was a wonderful thing, a wonderful experience to have my father involved with us in that way. But of course, my, my dad's greatest love was golf. And for whatever reason, when we were kids, golf was boring to us. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but back then, back then, these clubs were not steel or not graphite. They were wood, the shafts. And he started us in golf when they had wood shafts. And they were too long for us. Here we were down here, and little kids, and the, the club was way up here like this. So I said, I got an idea. I'm gonna saw the club down. So he saw the club down to make it fit for us. And then there we were, this is a picture of us. I wish we had it, of wood clubs that he had sawed in half for us to learn how to play and learn, learn to enjoy golf like he, he enjoyed it. What a wonderful thing that he did. But you know, I'm just saying, throughout my dad's life, he, he, was, he was an incredible example. And one thing about my dad, and it's already been mentioned now, is that he didn't say much. And he didn't tell us he loved us much. In fact, I, I can come in one hand the time he said, I love you. But he just showed it. He demonstrated that. And that's what made such a difference in my life and the life of so many other people. You felt God's love in him. And I have to admit, uh, I wish I was even half the man of my dad. And I miss him a lot. And it's only because, you know, I lived with him for the last several years to take, his, you know, take care of him and my mom. And now that I go to do these funerals, I did a funeral, three funerals yesterday. And, and I remember when my dad used to sit underneath the, the shade tree waiting for me and watching me. And, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful memory, but it's, it's difficult right now. I'm still fresh to know that, but at the same time, what I focus on is that he is with his heavenly father, and he is with my mom, and he is with his daughter that he lost years ago. And the rest of his family, I think of my Aunt Francis, I think of Mamie, I think of all of these people that are there joining him. Mr. Ramos, all these wonderful people. We look forward to someday being united with them. So in closing, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing us to share a little bit about what Ali Barra meant to all of us. And I just want to say in closing that I just wish for you what my dad has, which was his relationship with his Heavenly Father and a very close relationship with his family. God bless you all. Thank you. I don't want to take a... We're good? All right, good, thanks, Ray. Uh, don't want to take up a whole lot much more time because I know we're running a little bit on the late side, but uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. I, I, I was actually wanted to make this open mic time, uh, maybe take about five minutes, and if any of you would just like to share something that my dad has touched in your life or some memory of him that, that you would like to share with us, this is your opportunity. Uh, it doesn't have to be long, doesn't have to be a big dissertation. Uh, but if you'd like to say something, I'd actually like to give you the chance to have the mic to say a few words, and then we'll uh, begin to wrap it up from there. This is my cousin, Lito. My name is Lito Montes. Aunt Mauro was the younger sister of my father. Aunt Mauro raised me, Uncle Hal. raised me also. Uh, even Ken and the rest of the boys, I was considered myself the first child because they both raised me when I was a kid. And two things, two, three I can say about Aunt Myro first. Someone said she was a great dresser in high school. I remember Aunt Myro putting on glasses, makeup, a yellow blouse, black skirt, high heels. You tell her, Aunt Myro, where are you going? Water the grass. <laughs> And she dressed like that, you know. And just a couple of other things about her. I won't go into her, but I'll talk about Uncle L, which I call him. I don't want to say stepdad. I'll call him dad. He got me to play golf. And I'm a left-handed golfer. And I used to play with him because there was no left-handed clubs, but I played with him right hand and we used to play golf and finally he found me a set of left-handed gloves, left-handed clubs, and I started playing pretty good. And I used to beat him once in a while. He said, maybe you better go back to playing right hand. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I did that. No, I didn't do that. I kept putting it up at it. And another thing, he found, I'll make things very brief. He found me my first job in the trucking business because I wasn't doing so good as a student, as a person. And he got me play, uh, working in the trucking business. And um, I, I went to work for three months. I worked, ended up working there 35 years in the trucking business. So he got me started and making some money in my life. And when I made some money, I wanted to buy a new car. And Uncle Al took me down to Paramount Chevrolet in 1956. I had made enough money to buy a new Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. And we all, and somebody else mentioned that it was all, 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 all white area. So we went and uh, I had some money in my pocket. And I went and I told him, I like that car in the window. It was a 56 Chevrolet, powder blue and white. And Uncle Al went with me just as an advisor. And the kid says, looked at me, you know, he says, Mexicans don't have any money. I said, what do you mean got any money? I pulled out $3,000, you know. And of course, Uncle Al did let me buy the car cash, and then you buy it on payments. So he got me to do that. I have a hard time going on here. I'm a little stuck on words. But I think that's all I'll say. But just a reminder that L was my dad. And Aunt Marlo was my mom. I never really knew Ernie's children very well, but I understand one of them was a left-handed golfer. I never had a chance to beat him, but next time maybe I can. But, um, so I think that's all I have to say because I'm a little stuck for words. Thank you very much. A couple other people. Oh. Todd Carrillo. Um, I, I, I didn't know this until a couple of years ago, my mo but my mom had shared the story with me. Um, uh, my father and my mom uh, divorced when I was uh, pretty young, seven, eight years old. And as a, a, as a single mother, my mom uh, struggled quite a bit. Um, and um, I remember my mom said she was at church one time and she was trying to decide whether or not she should give her last couple of dollars uh, for her tithe. And um, she, she ended up doing that, and I think it was, I believe she told me it was seen by Alan Morrow, and they both um, put uh, some money in an envelope and gave it to my mom, uh, just for her faithfulness. And uh, seeing, and actually being there because we struggled with quite a few things uh, uh, growing up and everything, it, that just really spoke to me, it really ministered to me, because um, he didn't have to do that, but he did, because he saw a need. And uh, there are times when I, when, when, when I think about Al when it comes to giving. Um, um, his example, even though I wasn't there to see it, but it was shared with me later, um, it, it, it's really, like I said, it really ministered to me and it really spoke to me. And uh, I just felt that I should share that. And it's, uh, it'll stay with me until I die. And um, uh, for his family, I just... I'm, it's, it, it, it's just really great to know that uh, you guys had a special father, grandfather, um, great-grandfather. Just thought I'd share that. Thanks. Thank you, Todd. Oh, Anton. Yeah, I just want to, uh, I love Brother Al so much. And, uh, he used to come pick me up <clears throat> at least once a week towards the end of his life. We used to go out, play golf, and uh, he, uh, he's always teaching me. Every, 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 all those years that I played with him, he's always still teaching me how to, how to swing, and he even gave me one of his gloves, one of his uh, gloves that he loved a lot, and uh, we had a great time every time. And the most important thing was the peace that he had. He had so much peace, and uh, he was a very humble man, and uh, we had some... Uh, Real good experiences about his life. He tell me a, a lot of things about his life. How he started the first church in Panamano, uh, and how he uh, uh, how he enjoyed uh, serving with his friends there, Brady, his partners, and then um, he always would say uh, he always would, would bring God in the in the picture of everything that we talked about. He's always because of the grace and the love of God, he would say, you know. And uh, the, one of the things that uh, he shared a lot with me was how he was uh, spending uh, 
a lot of time with his wife and and while she was real sick and he and she was how he was it was hard for him and but uh we would pray and and he would say well why do you suggest you know and then i would i was like a doctor to him <laughs> i tell him well give her this and see it works and then the next time we got together hey it's working I said, well, praise God, That's a, the Lord put that together because, you know, I didn't plan anything like that, but God knows all things, and, you know, he, he uses all kinds of people for different ways to minister to one another, and that's, that's what the love of God and his grace and his mercy and, and it's all about, and, and, and a brother had all that in him. It was, uh, so, you know, uh, I miss the brother, and we all miss him a lot, and, but we will be together someday and rejoicing with him, and now, He's in a better place than we, where we are at right now. But we still have a lot of work to do here ourselves to share the love of God to all those neighbors around us. Amen. Thank you. I've got a, a video queued up that just shows a few images of my dad's life over his 92 years. We're ready to go, Rick? say is it's been a beautiful long 50 years but in fact it are short before you know it it's uh, we're here and uh, I think the formula to uh, real marriage is to uh, try to outgive one another and uh, I've, we've had our ups and downs our going arounds but uh, if uh, you make them think that uh, they're on ahead <laughs> You could always just kind of bluff it and come out just to, in other words, keep them thinking that they're the ones that are doing it. <laughs> and anyway, it's it's been a, a beautiful um, marriage. I really love her, and um, as God is my witness, I have never seen another woman as I see my wife.
is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final home. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city. Until the day God calls me home. The things of earth will dim and lose their value if we recall their borrowed for a while and things of earth that cause the heart to tremble remember there will only bring a smile but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day god calls me home this weary world with all its toil and struggle may take its toll of misery and strife. The soul of man is waiting like a falcon when it's released, it's destined for the skies. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city. Until the day God calls me home. Oh. This has been a really wonderful time, huh? A wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for sharing with us. I even heard, uh, Tim, just one more that wasn't mentioned. I think the first day that you came to church where Al and Marl were, someone stole your car, and Al and Marl, I don't know what it was, but like they replaced it, or they got you one, or they gave an unbelievable, but it's like, that's Al, right? That's Al and, and Marl for them. A few words in conclusion. We've remembered together, and just as these things have encouraged you, I want you to take memories that you have, because again, what does God want us to do on a day like this? He wants us to remember, because in remembering, then we were truly empowered for the present, and we're able to move forward into God's future. Not only should we remember, but there's another thing. On a day like this, we are to realize, I too will one day die. I tell you, whenever I was uh, with you as family at Morrow's passing, you realize my word, uh, they're in their 90s, right? So you, and uh, for anyone, if you had a sickness, if you had a difficulty in your life, there are times when you think about death. Do not think that it's peculiar, weird, or morbid. It is a reality that if you understand that you will also die, it actually will free you for how to live. So let, 
Let Al's passing remind you that you will die. The first birthday party that I went to in India almost 15 years ago, we went to a small little room and they, people had gathered a little cake and a man was, they asked one of the, the brothers to, uh, to talk and he said something, he did it both in Hindi and in English. And in English, it came like this. He said, you know, God so loved the world that he, he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. And he paused in the reading of John 3.16, or the, the, the repeating of John 3.16. And he said, you know, people are like cucumbers. They're like apples, they perish. <laughs> they perish. He said, when you go to the market every day, you go to the market, because you know in India, you don't go to the produce department at Vons or something like this. The produce department comes right in front of your place in, on a little push cart. And he says, you buy the fruit today because tomorrow it may perish. I'm sitting at a birthday party, right, in New Delhi, India. And this man is speaking to me one of the most profound things. It has continued to impact me. And this man at a birthday party said, you know, people are like, they're like cucumbers. They're like apples. They perish. So you must take them now. You must take them now. God loved the world in this way that he gave his only son that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish. I'm telling you, oh my God, they'll not perish. Hmm. But they will have everlasting life. We have this hope, and this is a hope that Al took deeply. He drugged his kids on this, he brainwashed them, and he walked it in himself. That Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and on the third day, he arose again. And listen to me carefully. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then everything you believe is vanity. And We've lied against the truth. But the fact is, Jesus did rise from the grave. And no one else, no one has done that. And he died for our sins. He died for my sins. He died for yours. And Al knew that he had died for his. I heard the testimony when he was, you heard it again here. He said that on the day that he received Jesus, he stopped the drinking, he stopped his smoking, he turned, he, he manifested the new life that was in him. We are family, we are friends here today. If Al were here physically, he would say, Brother Tom, do what you always did at Brady. Give my family, my friends, if there's someone that does not know Jesus, I don't know you. I mean, I don't know each of you in that sense where I would know. But if you have never received Jesus personally, maybe you're raised in a Christian family, in a Christian culture, a Christian, you know, you went to church for whatever, Christmas, Easter, something for marriages and such, but is Jesus in your heart? I know that Al discovered that. Well, I didn't, I never heard that, that when he went down, he just cried. You know, we all have something in our hearts and our lives to just stand before God and just with our open heart, just say, God, I need your salvation. If this is your day, listen to me. You're older than you were when Morrow died. If not now, when? Because you know what? People are like cucumbers. Oh my God, I tell you, <laughs> they're like cucumbers. They're like apples, they perish. And we too, I and you will one day perish. 
if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you receive the one who touched and changed Al's life also? And one other thing, we are to be right with God and we are to be right with others. If there is anyone that comes to your mind that you are not right with, I've been to many funeral services and been with many families in the time of loss. And too many times, hear me carefully, too many times on this continent and on other continents, I've heard people say, I should have said this to her. I should have said that to him. I should have made that thing right. The Lord Jesus said that if you know that something is wrong between you and a brother, go to that person and make it right. So right here, I don't know who's sitting behind you or in front of you or to the side of you. No one knows who just came to your mind. But if there is someone, an old friend, a family member, something happened years ago, but you know what? You can't forget it. I don't even know about it, but you can't forget it. Then here at this service for Al Ibarra, would you commit in your heart? You will go, go to that person. Maybe they won't listen to you, okay? But you will be re re relieved before your conscience and before God. Go to the person and say, do you remember years ago? And you know what? I've seen again and again, they do remember because they've not forgotten it either. It was the time when something happened between you, a time when a barrier was built, a time whenever a friendship turned to an enemy, enemy ship. I don't, that's not even a word, is it? An enemy ship, you know what I mean? Go in to make it right. Be reconciled. And before God, receive life. Because you know what? We're all like cucumbers. We're all like apples. We soon perish. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we bow before you in the name that's beyond all of our names. And what an honorable and good name that Ali Barra has. But Lord, we come to you in prayer in the name of the one who lived as no one else lived and died as he never should have died. But we thank you that Jesus died for our sins. And we thank you that on the third day he came alive from the grave to demonstrate that truly he had died for our sins. So Lord, hear the prayer of that person who says, I didn't think God when I came to Al's funeral service. I didn't think that I would have this in my heart. Hear the prayer of that person who says now, God, forgive me of my sins. You know everything that I have done. And you know, Lord, that I too am like that cucumber, like that apple. I too will one day perish. Father, hear the prayer of that person that says, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior now, right now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray to receive Christ, do share with one of Al's sons. Share with someone else that you may begin to have all that God would have for you. I close with this passage of scripture. Would you stand with me? I have a good friend, his name was Greg Burns. He was an American who went to Delhi and passed away there. We used to sit at table together and he said, you know, for many years, Brother Tom, my favorite passage of scripture was for me to live 
is Christ, and to die is gain. Greg was 42 years old when he died in New Delhi. But Greg said, you know, I've known the first part of that verse, for me to live is Christ. And since coming to Jesus, I've, I've, I've uh, wanted to live my life as Jesus would have me live. But he said, I don't think I ever realized, I just kind of put aside the second half of that sentence. And to die is gain. He said, I've always kind of thought of death as like a loss. For me to live is Jesus. For me to live is Christ. Yeah, yeah. But to die, well, I, I don't want to die. And that's, you know. But he said, now then, I am learning the second half of that. For me to die is gain. Share your loss. Help each other with the grief. But you know what? For Al, it is gain. Wow, that's incredible, isn't it? To be absent from us is to be present with the Lord. So he has again been reunited with Maro. And he has bowed before the Lord Jesus Christ. He has gone into a dimension that goes beyond what we can imagine. Here's a hint of that very thing. The Apostle John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was a new and holy city coming down from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying this, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. But the old order of things has passed away. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy, and these words are true. Thus is the reading of God's word. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, hear us as we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for you ministering to us as we have shared together to hear song and truths, Lord, through the singing, to hear, Lord, of what you did with a man who turned to you, a man who helped others, a man who drugged his sons to, to experiences, to parts, to church. Thank you, Lord, for Ali Barra and how he touched each of our lives. We do thank you, Lord, that his death is more difficult for us than for him. We have a loss. Al has a gain. So we thank you, Lord. Instruct us how to live the present in the light of the reality of the future. And we thank you, Lord. For though like cucumbers and apples we will perish, Yet those who know you, they live. They live. So I thank you that Al is with you and he is living as never before. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. No other. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Turn and greet someone next to you. Say God bless you, and I'm glad that you came.